Hello guys, you can hear me? <laughs> hey, welcome Stone. Woo, finally. Oh, finally. Woo. Okay. Great. Uh, oh my plan. God. <laughs> mute me permanently. <laughs> okay. Let me let me mute um, Deborah because she's she has my skeleton. So let her stay there. Good good morning, the people oh, on this side of the pond, and good evening, the people back um, home, and welcome to this talk today it's because I'm, I'm i'm frozen because i've seen um sire disappeared again um welcome to this talk today we're going to talk uh, tackle the issue of black tax and i have to clarify it's black tax in the african context because the black tax in the north Af american context is a bit different i don't know if any of us has the nuance to discuss that but we will see so um to a hotuba um Sire, uh, who appears as current sire, uh, st st uh, kiss, kick us off. Okay, um, my check, Posse, you can see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so a long time ago, before human beings developed cryptocurrency, myself and my five siblings had developed the trial versions, the first versions of cryptocurrency. Um, and it was actually called Chapo coin. Now, for those who don't know what Chapo is, Chapo is short form for chapati. Chapati is a flat Indian bread, um, very famous in Kenya. And in the days we were young, uh, we, we usually say chapati was chapati. It was the food that were, it was, a, it was not cooked anywhere you couldn't just walk randomly in a shop and buy it. So it was very, it was premium, it was it was unique. So that's back then. Um, those good old days are long gone. You now can with 10 shillings or 20 shillings grab a chapati almost anywhere. But back to those days when chapati was chapati. Um, we are six siblings in our home and we were raised up the African way to say in a fairly strict um, environment. And we love each other and we looked out for each other. But once in a while, your, your, your sibling would run into a mistake that would only be known by either you and him or you and her and just one or two other. And in those occasions, in order for them to secure your silence, to not report them to you are truly dad or mom, yeah, where uh, things could accelerate. Um, you always agreed, like, what will you, uh, how will you buy or purchase my silence? And the currency of choice was, you guessed it, chapo coin, like chapati was the means of settling um, such um, clandestine activities. Now, the amount of chapati to be given was proportional to the gravity of the mistake to be covered. Payments would range from anything from a pinch of your chapati, quarter of chapati, and for crimes that were equivalent to treason or thereabout, it would be a full chapati. Now, my mother knows she ha knows her children well, and she knows that we do not have the um, sudden generosity to just disperse chapati on a chapati day. She knows it's it's such prime property that uh, no one will just sit at the table and willingly give up their chapati. So to distribute chapati like that would be to call unnecessary attention to yourself. So this is how it would play out. Uh, we, we, we grew up in a very small space, extremely small. 10 by 10, to be precise, was the size of the home, um, total home. And so, the one rule in our house was food, meal times were same. You all ate at the same at the same time, partly to um, boost our family unity, and partly it was also the best opportunity to observe any um, bad behavior, but also really to manage those resources. It would be hard to figure out who's eaten what when if everyone was eating at their time. So it just made more sense to eat together. That as may be. Um, so we'd all sit around the table. And the first thing you all given was your bowl of stew. You're given your bowl of stew. Normally today that'd be beans or, or green grams. You know, that's what you're given. And then mom would distribute the chapati. So it would be probably one, one and a half or two chapatis. 
But if you were keen when the distribution was happening, people on that table are looking at each other. They are sending each other visual invoices and visual IOUs. You know, there's, it's, it's um, in Swahili, we call it boo-boo game. There is complete silence, there's radio silence, but the eyes are speaking. So uh, sibling number one owes sibling number three, sibling number four owns number one and number two. There's a lot of, there's a complex interaction that is happening um, over there. And it has to happen in perfect silence because if, mom catches a whiff of anything happening, it'll unfold the whole thing and it won't be pretty. Now, remember, mom knows none of us is generous to just begin pinching their chapati and giving to their siblings at will. So you have to wait for an opportune time. And it, I don't know if it was a, I don't know why, but almost always, like without fail, after mom has said grace for food, should always have to turn around to do something, you know, and it's, it's not a long turn around. It's actually like a 30 second turn around. Should either be turning off the fire or removing some cup, uh, some sufria of milk from the, um, the fire or it, just doing, or she's forgotten salt. There's almost something. And like, she literally does not leave the table. She just twists her torso to um, deal with whatever matter. But believe you me or not, in those 30 seconds of her turning around and then turning back, the amount of transactions that have flown on that table, a quarter chapati has left that corner and arrived in this one and eighth has gone to the other side. There's a half chapati a mid thing, and everyone again is back to complete radio silence and continuing to eat. Of course, there are a few siblings who are um, truant. They would not, um, they were defaulters, that's a word, they were defaulters they would not um, pay and settle, but would always carry it over. Yeah, so when I began hearing cryptocurrency, it brought memories of Chapo coin. Um, we, should, we should brand that. Possible. But just imagine, guys, bizarre or maybe humorous as this story is, what if I told you that that way of A, getting food, and B, settling debt became the normative thing in our home to date? It isn't, but just imagine if that became the normative. And I told you like, you know, yeah, all, all through growing up, that's how we'd get food uh, from each other or the, uh, that's how we'd get our nutrients and that's how we'd pay our debts. You'd be like, uh, you guys, that family has a problem. Because what we were using there was a mixture of um, entitlement, bullying, and just a bit of a small sprinkle of humanitarianism all put together. And if that became the normative way, there would be a problem. There'd be, we'd all agree there's a fundamental problem somewhere there. But what if I told you in a certain sense, when we're discussing the African setting, that has simply become the normative way. Follow me. Um, earlier this year, Kenya, the context, the report came out that the biggest um, honor of uh, one of the biggest honors of foreign currency has become diaspora remittance. The money and diaspora remittance here means money is sent by Kenyans abroad to Kenyans in Kenya. The amount has bypassed the money we make from agriculture, horticulture, tourism. Um, it has become a top forex ana for the country. Just, just, just think with me that way. And why I'm bothered, and I'm sure there'll be all manner of reaction to this, but why I'm bothered is this. The report showed us that majority of the money is sent A in fairly smaller denominations, um, anything between two and 10,000 shillings. And number two, it is sent for consumptions, for buying diapers, for buying milk, it's for paying for um, bus fare. Um, occasionally, it's for sending people to hospital or clearing some school fees. In other words, it's not for investment. There are a large chunk of it, like um, about 60% is for consumption. So just, just pause with me. Just pause with me that individuals who are abroad, who the large reason why they are able to send that amount is not because they have a lot, but it is because the dollar is stronger than the shilling have overtaken the productive sector back home. And now that I am partly also a diasporan, I do understand 
that A, making that kind of money is challenging, but then also B, similar to the story around my table, a lot of the money is received or requested through a mixture of blackmail, guilt trip, um, persistence, and all of very similar to how we did our chapel coin. Now, am I totally opposed to people sending money home? No, by no means. But what am I concerned about? I'm concerned that that man of getting money across has now overtaken our own productivity, that it has become the main thing and it is no longer the supplementary thing. Why should this concern me? It's because there's something about our African history that we probably have lost sight of. I had a chat with my mother some, some, some while back, and of course, to just understand our culture. And so she explained to me basically the life of a child, an African child from my community, the Lu here. When a child was born, the um, people who'd come in, in, in Luya, we call it to shave the child. It's basically um, the way your mother and her sisters come to confirm that this is truly your child, that no full play has been done, but it's it's a geist in the, in the name of, we're coming to shave the child and dress the child, but they really inspect the child from literally hair to toe to confirm like, yeah, these are our genes. But again, that's besides the point. So when the aunties um, come, they didn't come empty handed. They came with two sets of gifts. One set of gifts was the kind to make sure the um, lactating mother would be nourished. They came with food for that. But then they came also with preliminary gifts specifically for the child. In my culture setting, it would be things like chicken. Um, and if you are a bit well off, it'd be probably a goat. The idea was not that this would be cooked for the mother or of course cooked for the child. The child cannot eat chicken at that time. But the concept was that the mother can begin rearing this chicken and with time flip um, the chicken and be able to get to say a goat or a sheep, and then from there a cow. And it didn't stop there. When my father um, or a father has finished playing dowry, uh, dowry, what would happen is my uncles, my mother's sisters, the recipients of the dowry would then take a cow and a calf and give to me and my brothers. Very interesting um, bit so that they didn't just receive dowry and gobbled it up. No, they would take a, a cow and a calf and then come and as uncles give to me and my brothers, you know, as a kind of calf. Again, the simple idea being the same that if this is being given to me when I'm still young and as a child, as I keep rearing together with the other gifts I have been receiving, by the time I'm arriving at a marriage age myself, I'm not A, going to borrow, B, I'm not going to beg, C, I'm not going to steal. That from the um, gifts of chicken I got from my grandmothers and mothers and from the cows and calves I got from my uncles. By the time I'm arriving of responsible age, A, I have enough to trade to build a house. B, I have enough to put out there for bride price if need be. Well, there are instances where there was need for injection of some help from outside, yes. Um, one very outstanding example was in the case of death but it was done very differently. When a home came under bereavement, individuals in the bereaved home never lit a fire, or in, in my lawyer culture, we said fire was never lit in a bereaved home other than the fire to warm the mourners, but never was a fire lit to cook food. What would happen is the neighbors um, and the mourners are the ones who would bring food. Um, they bring a basket, and it's a culture my mother upholds up to today. We a basket in Luya is called a shmuero, so it's a um, uh, it's a symbol. Like when my mom is going for a bereaved place, she's saying, "I need an eshimuero. I need my basket, which is symbol for I need to bring things to relieve the home of the of the bereaved." But after um, the bereavement is done, people were supported and they were able to just go back to normal, and so. Imagine we've moved from a society where a help was the exception, it was not the norm, and we've progressively moved to now where help is not only the norm, but it is also expected, and at times, frankly, almost extorted from the people. We've moved to a point where funerals are not opportunities for neighbors to help, but they have become now basically chances where the bereaved 
can be able to brag. You know, they can bring in the funeral water and do all manner of things. And it's become an extremely expensive affair. So you now begin understanding why when I read the report of, when I read, read the report of diaspora remittance, for me, it wasn't showing a growing sector. For me, it was showing a growing concern because <clears throat> people have replaced productivity. The whole idea of my uncles will give me a cow so that I can grow the cow to now a point where my uncles will expect me to pay school fees for their children, um, pay for their healthcare and everything. Something has broken somewhere. And that's why we need to have an authentic dialogue about this whole concept we are calling African or black tax, or as Posse has put it today, specifically in the African context. What's going wrong? Why is it that we are now receiving hand downs instead of hand ups? Why is it that our black tax system is not allowing us to pay forward, but it is now becoming a concept where people are being hunkered down? And what can be done better? How can we um, get better? Because as I close, as Africans, we understand two things. We don't quite own, we hold in trust. And number two, we don't really pay back, we pay it forward. So the land I received from my father, I hold it in trust for my children, I don't quite own. And the education and the things that the community has poured into me, I don't fully own it and I can't repay the community, I pay it forward through other people. Why does it seem we've eroded all of that and now in Lua they call it Gonyua, in Lua we call it Mbeho, has now become the normative way by which people are supported. I'm hoping to get more answers to this, but I think we need to talk about black tax. Back to you in studio. Um, thank you, Saya. Thank you for, for, for that. And uh, I think you saw the diaspora remittances. I can reshare the screen uh, for us to just see how much um, we, we, we send. Like, um, and you can see the difference between 2021 and 2022. There's a whole leap. It's 200, as in without diaspora remittances, some things in Kenya would actually stop. In fact, um, a few years back, Njeru Givai, who was the um, uh, US um, ambassador, um, the Kenyan ambassador to Kenya, actually sat down with we um, 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 first and second generation immigrants to tell us to make sure we teach our children um, to continue this because they were afraid, but like my, my children don't have, uh, may not have to do the black tax thing. And that would affect the diaspora remittances. It's that big of a deal. And so, um, Tony, we will start with you. What is What exactly is black tax? Thank you, Posa. And hello, everybody from wherever you are. I will give a very simple definition of what we call black tax. It's, uh, it is when my salary or my income becomes expected to be shared by my family members. And I would like actually to extend it a little more. I think black tax in Kenya in particular, which is where we're focusing, goes beyond family. If you have buddies and you have gotten a job, you have uh, moved up a little bit from where, from where they were used to seeing you, they expect to partake, uh, so to speak, of your quote-unquote success. And I actually want to say that it does not only affect the middle class or the either lower or upper, it is actually affecting even the lower middle class. In my own experience, I have seen places where somebody has a job as a domestic worker. This is a person who's making around 10 Gs and uh, because they are now working in Nairobi and their family is in Mashambani, they are expected to be sending a piece of that 10 Gs home. They are actually expected to help educate their other siblings. So it affects uh, pretty much the people in the middle and the lower class. 
and it is uh, largely a result of uh, the lack of generational wealth. That's my simple definition. Then I'm just wondering, is black tax the correct term, knowing that Kenya is uh, multicultural? Our, are our Indian siblings, are our uh, Caucasian siblings of, of, of Kenyan extraction still affected by the same, or it's just a me, me, melanated problem? In to, my to, view, yes. In my in my view, it is uh, mostly we who are black, and I like what Saya said, and especially for the people that have come in late, that he does not necessarily think it's a bad thing. And I, I totally agree with Saya that it is not necessarily a bad thing to share. Um, my belief is that uh, when you have more, you have more so that you can share. But, and, and, and I mean, we are going to be discussing a bit more and I'll be dissecting that a bit. However, the expectation is largely from our, our, our black people. I think when I, from my own reading, when I was preparing, the people of Indian, Kenyans of Indian origin in particular, have learned how to, by and large, have learned how to invest. So they have generational wealth. So you'll see that they train their children how to get into the business that they have been. And so they have, in a sense, eliminated the need, the, a lot of financial need from their, or in their lineage. Uh, the whites who have been, who, the Kenyan whites, the people who uh, were born in Kenya and grew up in Kenya, by and large, I'm sure there are expectations, but by and large, they learned how to invest and they have uh, put money in trust for their kids such that, uh, when they become of age, there's some money that was put aside for them, either for education, either for travel, so that they are well prepared. But for the most part, we uh, Black people, we Black Kenyans, are the ones that are affected by this problem. Sean, do you have anything to add on the definition? And, and, and you can, uh, from your, because you're our finance person, what, what, uh, you, you, you'll start us off on what forms it takes. But just uh, uh, yeah, clarify if if need be on the definition of black tax. Thanks, Poza. Um, thanks a lot, Saya, for that intro. That, that that really set the background. So I mean, what do you when you research on the street definition of black tax um, has that um, ratio background? As it started in South Africa and used quite heavily in South Africa, where we all know the history of that country. Um, we don't need to delve much into that. Um, then in that context, it is about um, you know, if 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 you need to spread your resources as a person, right? Um your family unit, your nuclear family unit, so to speak, is not your only, um, you know, concern. You're talking about your parents, your siblings, your siblings' children, um, and you can extend that to to, to maybe your your relatives um, over and above that. Um, then that is a drug to, for example, the black professional in a way that other cultures, other races. Um, are not affected um, as much. But when you think about it a little more, um, and we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't want to um, delve into the racial context of this, but um, if you look at um, society as a whole, um, globally, we're talking about two main major ticket items in life that demand and consume resources. Um, at a greater level than um, other things in life. And that's education and medical costs. So if you're to divide up the world into um, sort of hom homogeneous um, experiences and the way economies um, are set up, you could start with say Africa and Asia, um, where how, how, how Sai has said the background, you know, uh, reflects so true for the African context. Uh, you could broaden that up to um, the Asian continent. Um, there are obviously complications in the way you 
put a blanket on people. But if you are to look at um, the Philippines, for example, um, and other similar countries where, um, like I said, um, remittances have surpassed manufacturing as a as the biggest contributor to output to GDP. Right. So, um, in the Philippines, for example, um, they dominate world tourism, um, cruise lines. Um, airplanes is, 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 is the main source of um, human resources. And, you know, a lot of that money goes back home. There's the complication of, for example, um, it's, it's not just someone working abroad sending money to their parents. It could be just someone who separated from their family unit, from their nuclear family unit. They need to go abroad to do a job and therefore they're sending money home to their own unit primarily. And then maybe um, the rest trickles to, to extended family, parents, and so forth. What I'm trying to bring out here is um, if you contrast that to the Western European experience, um, the setup economically is that they took those two big ticket life items and spread that cost across society. Whereas in the African Asian context, it really that, that cost is borne very heavily by the family unit. If you go to, sorry, if you go to the UK, if you go to Germany and such Western European countries, healthcare is free, um, education either is very cheap or free, or for example, in the UK, they put a cap on the tuition fees they charge um, at varsity, for example. Um, so, you know, you're quite heavily taxed as a society and that, um, you know, those, those, that revenue goes to cover for example, um, you know, medical costs for the elderly, you know, that can be a really big source of financial disaster. Um, and then, you know, fund public education from uh, primary all the way to, to, to varsity. So if you then contrast that to the American experience, so I'm drawing three um, major societies or, or cultures to, to look at. The American society is, um, confusing to look at. Uh, on one end, you do see some national health uh, programs coming through, but those have not permeated as in the same level as um, you know, Western Europe. So um, the social cost of meeting healthcare education, um, as you probably have seen the newest, um, really new, but the current hot topic is student debt, student um, loans, um, and therefore, the point here is that the American system has not um, sort of socialized those um, primary sources of, um, of, of social costs, that's education and healthcare. It's still on the individual, right? A bit more like Africa, but you know, in a country that is a lot wealthy, um, you know, you're able to, as a person, get student loans, and therefore you don't necessarily have to bother your parent uh, about it, and therefore you know, you still sit with quite an amount of student debt or credit card debt. The economy enables you to, you know, to, to, to make do um, as yourself, however heavy the cost is on you. Right, so um, in that way, um, since black tax is simply, you know, money from your pocket to your parents or your siblings and the children and to relatives, um, it ranges from, depending on the level of wealth in that family unit, it, you know, it ranges from just uh, limited forms of help. Um, someone needs help, uh, we all get together, we you know, give something and that's the end of it. Um, it's quite manageable. But I think what we're talking about here is um, almost gravitating, gravitating towards full blown over dependence on you. For example, um, you and a few others in your family that are, um, you know, one would say lucky enough to have a job and be economically um, you know, able. So, I mean, for me, the causes of that are, you know, just finally, just to touch on the causes. Um, one is the typical good old fashioned um, unplanned family, right? So children are treated as plan B, uh, or in this case, actually plan A, where you say, uh, look, I'll get as many kids as I want. Um, they'll take care of themselves. They'll take care of each other and society will take care of them. Um, like the saying goes, um, then um, in the then there's the non-intentional where you're talking about life events that have happened to your family unit. 
um, uh, someone died, um, left children, someone is very ill, cannot take care of children, um, or there was a job loss. Um, someone planned their life, but then life didn't work out and therefore, um, you know, they, they lost their income and therefore we all have to chip in. Or you can have a mix of both. Um, so that, that's, that's how I look at black tax. Um, it's not just in the African context or the black experience. It's how as a society we choose to deal with um, those two big ticket items mostly um, that cost a lot basically to survive. Um, so you know, in, in that way, those forms um, are either bonds by society or the family unit. Thanks. Sir, so, so, so if you're still there, um, so when did the rain start beating us? Because I'm thinking we were like very well planned before. In the 80s, I don't remember the black tax being this heavy, um, but when did the rain start beating us? And if you could touch on uh, the, the, uh, the black tax equivalent that is GoFundMe that's in the States right now, that would be awesome. Sire. <clears throat> okay, so... It's, it's, it's difficult to explain, or it depends from um, society to society, especially within the um, African context, but as the various economies, so I think two, two major things that have shaped, or in your own words, where the rain began beating us, has been A, um, post-independence, um, post African, when Ken African Kenyans, whatever, were getting independence, is where the showers began. Um, and then during the structural reform programs um, that began in the 90s, um, I think it is when it intensified. And this corroborates with two important things that changed. One is the complete change of our economic model where individuals, uh, for quite some time, the, I like the way Stone has said, um, wealth, um, it has to do a lot with wealth. What happened in post-independence is two important things happened. One is how we defined wealth, and two is how we got wealth um, changed. So wealth was largely defined by being able to get a white or a blue collar job, so being employed. And then how we got it therefore was we had to leave the farms, which were seen as dirty, um, low grade and stuff. And as a result, we ended up moving into cities and there was a lot of cramming and um, a detour here that may be helpful. One thing that tells you here is probably where the rain began beating us is look at the African names we use for the capital cities or for the urban areas in Kisi, they call it Voravu, uh, which means the place of light. Um, in Luya, we use either Irwani or Evlafu. Irwani means outside, or Evlafu means a place of, of light. So we always saw um, the villages as dark, and we saw the urban settings as a places of light. And there was therefore a flight of um, human, human capital, and many, the, the aspirations of many guys then became the ability to run away from the village. Then the bigger second thing that happened is the when we changed how we define wealth, it meant as opposed to the past where success was defined by you've reached maturity, you're able to have your house, you're able to manage your farms and stuff like that. Um, soon we began having a very flashy um, definition of success, you know, being able to, um, from as ridiculous things as being able to show up with better pots and pans, you know, that were flaunted during um, village events to being able to have bread um, during your event. We just meant there was a shift in our value, in our value system. And because Tony living in um, his shags could not be able to provide this, he left the opportunities that were there in shags and then moved to the um, place of light. And I, I know down the road, we're going to have a, a discussion on land helplessness. What therefore happened in a very big measure is the people who remained back in the village acquired a form or a variant of helplessness. One, because we changed their language, we called the villages the dark places 
and we called the cities the places of light. And then secondly, because the inputs that were needed for farming, first of all, physical, and then secondly, financial, were rerouted to the cities as opposed to being in the village. I think that's where systematically the um, thing happened. And then at the national, so at, that's at the macro, micro, the village level, um, our value system shift and all of that. But then now at the national level is from very few African countries have been properly managed economically um, and socially. And when the economic downturns of and the structural adjustments programs of the 90s began, um, coupled with this previous thing about people shifting to the rural, um, the, the rural urban migration, it meant that there was a lot more financial pressure. So here are people who've left the land who've gone to try and make it out of the village. And then they land in spaces where the economies have been thoroughly mismanaged and therefore people are caught. J just look at how people live in urban slums. Um, it is indignified, but the people who would rather stay there than go back to the village. Um, so I think those two forces combining is probably why this thing has accelerated, especially from the nineties um, going forward. Um, a smaller other um, important piece is um, the, the children raised, the children we, the children raised therefore in this new thing have largely been raised in urban settings or when raised in the rural settings, we were raised up with a mind frame for this is a temporary arrangement. As soon as you can, please run away from this. All help is from Nairobi. Um, all good things come from Kisumu or Nakuru away from this. So we were never raised up to see the opportunities that existed immediately where we are. And the net result of this is we grew up some variant of dependence. When you put all of those things, it comes together. And then I know I've spoken long. Therefore, the ultimate solution became when, when um, our economies were not doing well, and with the initial wave of the airlift of the 60s, there was now a new air, um, airlift of the 90s, people fleeing, there was a lot of, of brain drain because when you came to the city, soon everybody with you in the city had or competed for the same opportunities. And therefore um, the diaspora, whether it was initially towards the West, and then with time it became Asia, the um, going to be house helps in, in, in Saudi Arabia and stuff became the new level of emancipation. It was just a different theater, but it was exactly the same thought and the same thought pattern that had moved us from the village to the, to the city. And because we were then raised with a consistent generation of employees, we did not have like what um, both Tony and, 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 and Stone have pointed out, we didn't have, um, generations of people who know how to be wealthy. We had cases of people who knew how to be rich, but we did not have um, generations of people who knew how to be wealthy. The, the driving thing was move as far away from your poverty as you can, and then turn right around and give money for whatever reason. You need to give a lift up, you need to show off, you need to also show that you've arrived and that that became the driving side. And I, I fear that we have become um, trapped in all of this. A case in point is, when you really look at a lot of the money you asked for back home, when you really think about it, it's two things. One, hardly is it ever money to invest, it's money for consumption. And then secondly, when you critically ask what it is being used for, a lot of it is for um, wants, not really needs, you know. Um, your, your cousin wants a phone, you know, just wants a, a better phone with a better camera. He, they'd rather spend 10,000 um, trying to gather than invest in, in something else. And it's just the same culture um, that is perpetuating. My two cents. Those were 35 cents. Um, let's go to pros. I mean, we have to have a positive twist, right? Uh, Tony, let's start with you. What are the pros of, of black tax? So if, we, if it has an, another, a different nice name, um, <laughs> when it's being utilized in the, in the proper way? Uh, all righty. Uh, yeah, Posta, thank you for actually saying if it has a pause, another way, because I, I struggle with uh, blackenizing things that are bad. I mean, we are black, are we bad? 
and I know that that can uh, take the conversation to a different tangent, but uh, yeah, I'll try to stay on the, the positives like you have put. So I had said earlier that I believe that uh, you are blessed to bless. When you have more, you should share. So you, it, it teaches us to be generous. And I like what Saya was saying about how our African communities were organized and uh, generosity was a thing that was practiced clearly. And sharing what we have, especially if you are coming from a poor background, is okay. It is okay, of course, up to the level where you're not killing yourself to help the others. Because uh, in one of the posts that I had put, there's something that I really like that he had said, that you should, I, don't, I wonder whether it was you or him, that you should actually put on your mask before you help other people. That's what we are told when we are riding on, on the airplanes. You're told to, in case of an emergency, put on your mask before you can help someone else. So helping people uh, who are in need in principle is a good thing. So there is a way that we can learn to use our resources to empower our other relatives if they are actually in need. So I don't know if this is a point where we actually dissect whether they are in need because we are looking at the positive uh, bits of black tax. But yeah, according to me, if you have and you have uh, there's a way that you can share. I think you should share. Uh, I think that there are parameters that you need to put in place so that you're not killing yourself helping others. Uh, and we will discuss those, I think, as we go along, which include putting them in your budget and limiting and things like those. But yes, there is a positive aspect to this because it is generosity in the first place. Um, Stone. Is there a positive aspect and as an investment and financial consultant, how are you um, teaching us and the people and um, you interact with to plan around uh, around black tax? So the, the positives and how are we are you because it's inevitable. You have to like the way we, we get insurance for health and death nowadays. Um, how are you helping people plan for that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so that, that's quite a, the latter part is quite a, a lengthy discussion that you know, would rather touch on at uh, much later parts of the discussion. But on the positive spin for black tax, um, I think honestly, we, we find it very hard to find any positivity. Um, one could say the fact that you do uplift economically uh, members of your family. You remember when we were young, uh, most of us grew around a sea of cousins, um, all sent from the village um, to look for better opportunities and mostly funded by our parents. So you can imagine if our parents didn't go through to the extra mile of um, educating this, um, you know, um, these people in whatever shape or form, uh, whatever little they had, um, the amount of economic gain that has, you know, permeated uh, most families. Um, the world will be a, a lot more miserable than, you know, <clears throat> than it is now. Um, Saya touched on a lot about the, the, the communal background of we Africans and how a lot of BT is rooted in um, aims at social cohesion, right? So you grow up communally, um, you cannot go and isolate yourself. You need to Kurodisham um, Kono. And then one can you know, extend that to character building. So on the one extreme, you can imagine rearing a child who knows no trouble, who knows um, only to get for himself and to eat for himself and look out for no one else. And that's a bad outcome in any society. So any, any, any attempt at, you know, having someone be able to look around, um, see the misery around them and stretch out their hand to help, that's always a good thing. Uh, so there are positive aspects of, of, of black tax, um, those cannot be 
ignored. Um, but I think obviously um, what bothers all of us is the more unmanageable and insidious forms of black tax that basically um, you know, destabilize us mentally. Um, our outlook for life um, just gets really different. We are not as happy as we should. And therefore, you know, we, we can talk about that a lot more, but the positive spins are, are there definitely. Thanks. Because Joanne Aligitosa kwa ulingo, because there's no other word like that. Um, um, Joanne, do you want to speak about the, the uh, your comment, the money wounds and um, healthy boundaries? Joanne is my friend and I always throw her into the fire every time she appears. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to come on camera. So, um, I really like this conversation. Um, just because of my background as a coach who helps people with their uh, childhood wounding, I think the one thing we don't talk about um, or we don't really think about much is um, how our belief systems about money were formed, um, whether it's from observing how our families deal with money or how our communities deal with money or how, what the church says about money. And therefore we end up having money wounds. And I use my story as an example. Um, I'm a child who grew up who was born into a family where there was um, generational wealth. However, in that same in that same environment, money was the source of all evil or the root of all evil from a religious perspective. So um, <clears throat> the beliefs the be and, and 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 then my dad ended up um, losing his job due to alcoholism, which is a whole different story, right? That's, that creates a different set of wounds. But then the extended family, because usually generational wealth comes from grandparents and extended family. It's not like just within the one unit, the, the um, family of origin, which means mother, father, and and, and mother, father. So for me, it wouldn't, the generational wealth is not just from my mom and dad. It is from my grandparents and what they passed on to their children. Um, <clears throat> when there's alcoholism in the family or drug abuse or mental illness, that generational wealth is held back because of um, shame, because we don't look at alcoholism or drug abuse or any of those things, the social ills as, um, <clears throat> as diseases, which is what they are. And therefore that struggle that my mom had to struggle to raise us because of having an alcoholic husband created um, money wounds. Um, so, there's, there's fear around the, the, the fear of poverty, which is basically a wound. There's the, there's the uh, what do I want to call it? There's the deep shame of not having enough, not being enough, um, not enjoying the things that the rest of your family is enjoying, knowing very well they're available to you. So for me, just understanding those things by myself, right? Because there's no class, there's no, these things are not taught in school. Understanding what, what I think about money, what my personal relationship with money is, um, and creating the boundaries around money. No, even if there's that good thing about sharing what you have, taking care of your personal needs before taking care of others. You know, like when you get in a plane, they tell you put on your seatbelt first and then put on the one for the child or whoever else you're, you're traveling with. We tend, when it comes to money, we, we tend to be, to guilt trip ourselves. And therefore when somebody asks for something, we've already guilt tripped ourselves 
And so we give before we take care of our own needs. And that's what I mean. Having boundaries with myself, knowing what are my needs? How am I spending my money? Am I living within my means to make sure that my personal needs are taken care of so that I can give from the overflow versus giving everything and then living in constant struggle um, with whatever it is I earn. Because regardless of whether you're the person who is earning the 10K or the person who is earning the 1 million, if you cannot manage the little you have, you're not going to be able to manage abundance. So it's just shifting your mindset from that scarcity that we are taught as children, regardless of whether we are in those rich families, the families that we call rich, or if you're from the quote unquote poor families, it's how it's, it's basically, it boils down to your personal relationship with yourself and therefore with money and all the other things that come around uh, being a human being. That's Joanne, all I wanted. Joanne, as usual, Asante Sana. Um, I hope. Uh, yeah, I hope that was clear. And and since you've um, uh, sent us through this trajectory of the cons of, of black tax, um, Saya, I know you commented that the Harambe speech is a positive side of it, and I, I beg to differ. And I want to give an example of um, funeral funeral. Um, what are they called? F uh, funeral. Uh, uh, like if I contribute towards uh, a funeral back in my, which village should I use this? Uh, Ebuboko village in, in back home, my name will be announced back there in the village with the amount that I have been given because people keep tabs. And if you don't show up, they don't show up for you. And it's the, I think it's the wrong side of the Harambe spirit. Um, so had you be, uh, would you like to comment on that and just continue with the trajectory on um, the cons of of black tax? So um, on this one, I'll I'll, I'll name it quickly because I need to shift location. Um, the original what I was commenting on is the pros of the original Harambe spirit, the idea of let's come together, let's um, we, we we have let's pull our resources together. Let's um, lift one guy who is um, either going to school or is in need of education or of help, and then they will return back. That was original Harambe spirit. But I think the Harambe spirit has suffered under every other thing I commented, um, and that's now why it's coming to um, Harambe's have now become nothing more, in many cases, not always, but have become something of uh, a roll call, like a... Um, I'm giving to either show off or I'm giving because I want you to give me um, next time or because it's become an expectation. So I think it's a case of a positive thing that has undergone abuse because even on the political side, for instance, Arambes then became political tools and vehicles of corruption. And But then we say we don't judge a philosophy by its abuse. Um, I think the Harambe spirit has been abused but we judge a philosophy by its logical outworking. So if allowed to outwork itself properly, the Harambe spirit is and was a continuously genius thing. Yeah, gotta run. Okay. Um, so, um, Tony, the, the cons of black tax, and if there's a, if there's a different name you want to give, it to, give to it. Uh, I think I'll just keep it black tax. The, the cons are many because I like what Saya has just said about the Harambe spirit. And just going back to, we were looking at the positives of uh, black tax. And the reality is that uh, in the developing countries and in most of our families, there, there is not a lot of generational wealth. So the possibility that one will support their family in one way or another financially is there, especially if they get a job. So we need to live, we need to be alive to that situation that for most of us, it is something that may be expected of us. Now, what is what problems would come from this? Number one is uh, this dependence where 
you see, when we use the word tax, uh, we were discussing this with my wife at some point, that uh, the word tax is such a big word because it sounds very much like a, an obligation and expectation. And when you don't do it, you are fined or you are punished. So in this case, my family, for instance, expects me to give them a chunk of money, whether or not I have that money such that when I am not able to give, they do not understand and they guilt trip me or they blacklist me or they do whatever it is that they do in my community. And that's the cons of black tax. When the expectation is so unfair that uh, my family decides that I'm now their tap. Every time they need money, they turn the tap on to open for the money. And uh, when they turn the tap on and the money does not flow because they are so entitled, they get upset and they throw a tantrum. So that's one of the things that uh, I consider one of the cons of black tax. Another thing is that uh, some of us are so guilt tripped. And I mentioned the case that I actually know of a lady, a young lady who was working as a house help and she was earning very little money. And she's expected to help her family educate her siblings. And uh, never mind that she never finished high school, but she is educating a sister to go through high school. And she's guilt tripped by everyone. So they don't even, because she's in Nairobi. Nairobi is where the money is. So everybody calls you uh, with a please call me, you know? So you have to call back. You end up using all your money. So you are crippled. You do not, your financial goals are zero because you are doing uh, your siblings a favor. You are helping them. Uh, go through school, you're giving, you're giving them pocket money. So that dependence can cripple you, the giver, and uh, it would end up taking you to the place where Joan was talking about. Perhaps maybe you had other wounds or you didn't have any wounds, but you see your relationship with the money in this sense, of course, you are wounded. You are the one working for the rest of your family, yet the place that you are putting them, you never got there. And I'm talking about a real case that I know. So I'll stop there to allow someone else to talk about that. But those are two of the ones that I see that are very glaring. And, and would you also just comment on the, the power? Um, okay, Deborah, would you comment on the, on the, on the power shift? Like in, in the political circles and also in our families, the people who, the black tax givers, the ones who are the money people, the amount of power and abuse they, they met out on the, the recipients. Um, would someone please comment on, uh, on it? Deborah, you can start and then Tony, I think, because I had uh, I had prompted you, you can go next. Deborah, go ahead. Thanks, Posa. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to say this is a very important conversation and we need to have it as difficult as it is. We need to have it and I hope it will be a continuous one. Um, in terms of power dynamics, I think the very origin of black tax is as a result of economic imbalance. Um, yes, you know, there's an aspect of it that we will say results from um, our social construct as Africans, but I think we need to go deeper. And the deeper part of it is being able to appreciate that this arises from economic imbalance. So economic imbalance in families, as well as economic imbalance um, based on where people are. So whether they're in the villages or in the city centers where they're able to get work and get therefore get an income. Now, having said that, um, the, this imbalance is continuously perpetuated Okay, so first, that's where it starts from. But it's continuously perpetuated even to the point of politicians. I'll give you an example of myself, you know, a conversation I had recently. And we were comparing, um, I won't give their names, but two governors. And we're having a very heated debate in our family about who we should be voting for. And, and this is a family of very, you know, exposed, educated, um, you know, and politically aware people. And to my surprise, they were actually saying we should support a candidate because they showed up for our funerals. And I was shocked. And I said, what's the difference between you who's educated 
and wants to support this person because they came to your funerals and the guy who's at the ground, who is supporting him because he's been given 200 shillings, there's absolutely no difference. It's still the same Gonya attitude that, that, that Saya alluded to. So you see, this thing has just become what we deemed as positive, though I have my own separate views about it, has been perpetuated and it has become very negative. And even at the family level, you find that people will exercise that power or abuse that power because they are the ones who are economically, um, you know, uh, um, um, who, are, who have some economic power. So it continues to be perpetuated. On the flip side, those who are not economically, um, who are, don't have that economic power, continue to stay in that state and do not therefore find ways to elevate themselves. You know, and, and we can have a separate conversation about poverty of the mind so that you are stuck in a situation where you always see that other person who's in the city as being, you know, your savior when you can actually at your own level elevate yourself. So we need to just break down this whole thing and be real with the conversations. You know, how can I help myself? Yes, my sister can help me pay school fees or my brother can help me pay school fees. But once they've paid school fees, I need to go and get a job and stop depending on them. There's an over-dependency that we need to, to speak about. I mean, I can speak about this all day, Posanus, but that's just my thought. We are having a conversation on land helplessness because it's the sister or sibling conversation to this one next week. So Deborah, you know, you'll get the link. Um, Tony, what's your, what, what do, do you have a, do you want to piggyback on what Deborah said? Sure, sure, I do. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah, for that uh, foundation uh, so that I can just build on the same. I think in, in some cases, and I love that she went uh, to, in the political direction, we have uh, that dependency syndrome has overtaken us so that, uh, and it has been perpetrated in part by our leaders, our political leaders, and also in part by ourselves, the recipients of these uh, handouts, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll use the word handouts uh, at this point, because they, it gives power to the bearers of the money and uh, renders the recipients powerless and it may i can even i can even uh, even when i look at families and uh, i would not talk about my family because i respect them but uh it is not different from other families the, re the relatives who were well off at some point what are the ones that we looked up upon and they in some cases they, they did not behave very well because they would buy you a crate of soda i, I grew up in the era of sire where chapatis were a rare delicacy. Now, even more rare than chapatis was a box, a crate of soda that we would get maybe during Christmas. So this uncle or auntie or relative who comes around that time of the year is the only one who can afford to bring you like a crate of soda. They bring that and then they are rude, they are weird. They, they think that they have a ticket to behave the way they want because they have a little more money than everybody else. And that syndrome is the same, is the same one that our politicians have. They have the money and we are the recipients. So when they come to ask for our votes, uh, just like uh, uh, I'll call her Anditi, though, that's the name I'm seeing. She has talked about those guys because they're giving us some money. They now, or because they are they're attending our funerals and giving us some money there, now we owe them. So they hold power. Power is now equal to the money. And that balance is kept that way so that we are ruled because we are quote unquote uh, unable, and I like that we're going to be talking about uh, land, land, uh, land what? Land helplessness. We have land to be helpless in, their, in, in the face of this whole uh, continuum. They are the ones who can help us because they have money. Instead of us thinking how we can be creative, instead of us thinking how we can invest, like Sai alluded to, we ask money to buy diapers, not to invest, not to develop ourselves so that we can learn to be, um, to be creative and create a little bit of money ourselves to get out of this uh, vicious cycle. Okay. Um, yeah. Tone, before you, uh, before you disappear on us, um, 
uh, just the same stone, the same um, things. Um, what are the cons? And if the if you oh, it can also comment on the power and how we've allowed, especially politicians and people in power, to just have bad manners. And we see it in our funerals. We 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 let them talk about nonsense. And and that time you're 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 the bereaved. You're mourning your person, and they're talking about very weird stupid things because they give us 50 bomb and it's all courtesy of black sex. So uh, the same line of conversation, uh, Stone. Yeah, I think um, a lot has been said about that angle of uh, the way um, the effects of BT scales up to guess politics at national level um, and there is a reflection of what we are and how we deal with each other. But um, few um, instances where I've found black tax to be quite something is um, typically, you know, it starts when you get that job and, you know, um, you have few responsibilities, you are able to help, you have no problem helping. Um, it's not like you have anyone else to help, you don't have a family yet, so you do that. Right. Um, then there is informational symmetry where people don't exactly know what you earn. We, we, we don't tell each other what we earn. So people assume you earn quite a bit and therefore that dependency grows and it never stops. Right. So the, the worst thing about um, black tax is that in the way life happens uh, and especially economics, I think in the Bible we, we, we learn about the concept of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Um, and that, that, that is the description of economies worldwide. They're very cyclical. Um, you know, um, you remember in the 90s how life miserable was. Uh, for most of us, things picked up uh, in the 2000s. Um, and that is reflected on an individual level, right? So what happens then is that when your extended family relies on you, you spend quite a bit on them. You have small kids, you don't have too much expenses. And then life happens. Um, the economic cycle turns, um, you have that job loss or so your business hits a, a really bad spell. And then that's exactly when your family needs you the most. They need more resources, right? Because needs have gone up. And we find that most of the time that's when you have nothing. And therefore, that breeds resentment um, in, in children. Uh, at least that was the experience that I saw a lot uh, on my end with my friends. So, you know, humans have a terrible um, way of imagining bad outcomes. We are really bad at that. Uh, we are quite optimistic as a, as a species. We, then that's how we survive. Quite a harsh life. So you, you find that um, when you get that job, you always think it will always be there. Um, the way you're spending is sustainable. And you know what I'm highlighting here is that you must think about bad outcomes. Um, what will happen, for example, if you run out of that income that you have? How will people survive? And you'll be surprised people will survive, whether with you or not. Um, if you die, they will find a way to survive. Um, that's really what disturbs me about um, black tax. And the, and the effect it has on your on your primary family unit is, um, you know, your children did not ask to come to this world. You brought them in, but your parents had a say in how you came in. And therefore, the balance of need is, is really not equal at all. So and then um, you can imagine the effect on marriage where rarely do people agree on how much, you know, one spouse is spending on their family. Um, and the more that dependence grows, the more the costs, um, you know, increase. And the more you have to spend on that family to keep, you know, everything in order as everybody has described. Um, therefore, the, the, the social costs of black tax are, are real. And we should talk about them and how to break them. Um, you know, you could talk about effects on, you know, um, the recipient. Uh, in insurance, there's a principle called um, moral hazard. And, and that's, behaving in a way that increases the risk of that event you fear um, to happen. That's why maybe you can leave your car unlocked because you have insurance, you'll be fine. 
And so the giver here, mostly, even though we know people are well-meaning, mostly, um, parents especially, but as soon as there's a, a lifeline, there's a, there's a source of, you know, um, what is it, good stuff coming through. Um, like we've said here, the concept of, of land helplessness, um, suddenly they become extremely helpless. Um, you suddenly leave everything to them. And um, parents get a lot more comfortable to bite more than they can chew. Uh, you, you, could have, you could talk about um, children as plan B leading to um, getting more children than you ideally should, um, or investing a bit more recklessly or spending their money a lot more on relatives. Um, and therefore, you know, um, that can also scale up to effects on country, finally. Uh, you know, you talk about, um, you know, if you spread resources too thin within a certain family unit or a certain, um, you know, social group, then the more little resources there are per person, then the less effective they are. If you talk, if you take, you know, a thousand, um, take a billion shillings, divide that up by two people, the amount of economic multiplier that has um, in that in, in that unit. And if you take that same sum and divide it up amongst 20 people, and therefore, you know, as a country, then how we build wealth is severely limited. And that is an easy pointer to how as, you know, as an African content, continent rather, um, significant parts of Asia, it's the same vicious cycle of um, we work a lot, we do a lot, probably work harder than most Western, Western societies, and yet we, we're getting nowhere because we haven't planned our lives in a way that personal agency um, takes the forefront, um, that we plan our lives instead of you know, relying on our children and our relatives and, and, and so forth. And then it takes a lot more longer to build national wealth because um, we spend the first 10 years of our lives taking care of a lot more people than ideally we should. Thanks. Thank you. And I think um, the other aspect that we don't talk about is the effect that it has on the people in the diaspora. They are working. It's not so bad. Their asses off. There are many are dying. Many are losing um, their minds, and they're losing their children because they they work so hard for people um, back home that they forget their own family. And we are seeing um, a generation of of um, um, second and third generation Africans who have lost uh, their values, as in they are. Um, into drugs and alcohol. And it's because they've not been parented because the parents have been busy working to, to save the whole village back in, um, in Ebuboko village. Okay, uh, as uh, the norm is on, on this forum, we always ask um, what's the way forward, as in what's the positive spin to all this? And um, Tony, we will start with you. And Stone, I think it's the moment you can actually tell us now the bulletproofing part. And for the people um, on, the, on the call, if you have questions, you can type them, you can text, or you can put up your hand. Um, I always allow for comments. Thank you. Tony, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Posa. So what can we do? So number one, I think we had agreed that we, growing up in Africa, in Kenya, the possibility of this being part of our burden is high. So we have to be cognizant of that. So if that is the case, then I think one of the things that we must do is be very bold to discuss money because money is not something that we discuss openly in Africa, in Kenya. Very few people know how much anybody makes. So I think we have to break that down and start being able to comfortably discuss money so that if my family expects that uh, I'm supposed to support them. I will tell them I am able to support you with this amount of money. So it is first and foremost uh, talking about the money and also drawing a boundary so that uh, if I know that I'm supposed to give them X amount of money because they really need it, I put it in my budget. That is uh, possibly, if, according to me, I think that's the uh, line one of defense. Of course, 
if we are able to support them so that they are able to be independent even better so that we are not supporting them to buy diapers but we can support them perhaps to create uh, some income themselves. So we can look at whether it is upskilling, whether it is business, whatever it is that we can do. When I was researching for this, somebody told, uh, somebody was, had, had uh, talked about helping our parents in particular with something like health insurance, because if it is the parents that are asking for this money, and Stone had told us about the big ticket needs, health being one of them, perhaps we should consider investing in uh, health insurance so that we avoid being called every time somebody has a toothache. Uh, we avoid being called every time somebody cut their finger when they were uh, cutting napier grass for that cow. So we might want to consider something. Uh, there, there, there's uh, this thing that we do that is first aid. Uh, uh, there's a word that, that was used for it. There was development and there was relief. So instead of giving relief, we give development so that we can win them off dependency. So we are supporting them so that they can be on their feet as opposed to always giving them um, relief because that keeps them coming. And uh, one of the things that we, we have all learned or we will learn about freebies, freebies are not very helpful. We don't value something that we don't work for. So if we are constantly giving people freebies, we are getting tired, we are getting depressed. Uh, the diaspora people are getting into drugs because of those needs that we are asking them to meet. And we're not even honoring those, those freebies they're giving us. We ask for money for once, like, uh, like is it Sai who told us, for once. So it's because we are not working for these things. So we can waste this money. It's very easily wasted because we didn't work for it. So we can work towards uh, development. I, I, I had a really interesting quote that I want to give you, I had written it down. Uh, it, is, it is from that saying that when you give a person fish, you feed them for the day. When you give, when you teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. Then that person added a twist to it and said that uh, if you buy the lake, whether communally or, or individually, you feed them for generations. So we need to think about teaching them how to fish and even buying a lake for them so that we are feeding them for a lifetime and hopefully for generations. Thank you. St Stone, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so formal tools, right, to manage the problem of BT. Um, it's complicated. Um, there are forms of it that are almost hopeless. Say you have a really sick parent and you know, there's not too much you can do about that. You have to spend as much as you can um, to write the situation. But what we're trying to do here is to just find threads where um, what we can do that is useful, then we, we, we do that. And like how Tony touched on insurance, um, this, we cannot understate the benefits of, of insurance. And what I was trying to do at the beginning was to say, whatever action you take as a person, you have to think about who's going to bear the cost of that. So while we may sit here and complain about BT, what are we doing about bulletproofing, in that case, our own lives so that we do not uh, become burdens to our next of kin? If we don't do something about that, if we don't um, ensure that we are not climbing the high horse and doing nothing about it, then we will never break the cycle. And if, if, if you're here and for example, if you're in Kenya and you have no life insurance of any sort, um, then what you're planning is that, you know, the moment you die and whatever resources you build, which is not much, um, especially when you have young kids, um, family life just takes a lot of your resources. What you're planning is that um, you're going to transfer that cost you brought into this world to your brother or your sister or your parents who've been left behind. And um, that is that, that must be completely unacceptable. So you, if, if you're in this forum, for example, and you have no life insurance, you have to sit and think, what exactly is the plan here? 
um, is it that when, you know, in the unfortunate event of my passing, then, um, you know, I, I don't care, you know, or I don't want to think about it, or it's just too difficult to think about it. That doesn't help. So what I tell all my friends is, you know, for as low as a thousand shillings a month, you can insure yourself for a million shillings and you can scale that up by your level of wealth and whatever you want to leave behind. Um, when you talk about medical insurance, uh, Tony uh, touched on that very well. Um, that social cost, you want to not bear that yourself um, or as a family unit. You want to spread that to society. Um, like for example, Western Europe has done very well. And so insurers exist to try and spread the cost of, for example, um, the financial disaster associated with an illness amongst many people, right? So we get 100,000 of you, um, you pay a lot smaller amount of money than you would pay you know, over the lifetime of, say, your parents or yourself in terms of a, a medical emergency, right? And then people know this, people know the benefits of insurance, you know, no, no, nobody here will say, I, I don't think that's um, for me. The problem is a lot of the times when people come to me, um, you know, it's almost too late. People get interested in medical insurance, for example, when someone is already sick. And then that becomes a very difficult conversation. Uh, there's someone I know who likes to say, you, you know, you cannot come to an insurance company and then your house is already burning up the hill. And then you tell the insurer, you, do you see that house burning over there? I need you to insure it. It just doesn't work that way. It's, it's not an economic um, equation that would work anyway. So start early. If you have aging parents, if you're lucky, maybe your parents have not retired or just about retired, make sure you almost bully them into getting a medical plan. You could even start it yourself. You could pay the first premium and tell them, look, um, we need to have a con honest conversation here. We've started this plan for you. There is no more spending money on frivolous things, you find your parent um, either farming things they shouldn't or painting things they shouldn't, spending money on that odd relative they really shouldn't. And you tell them, look, you, you, you will spend money fast on this insurance plan. Do not let it lapse. If it lapses, that's on you, right? And you blackmail them with all the principles that they taught you in childhood. You tell them, this is what you taught me and I'm playing that back to you. You must remain true, you know, to certain principles in life. And number one here is to ensure that you're in good shape so that now, you know, the, the, the destructive nature of life events are not spread, um, you know, to everyone in the family. Um, over and above that, there's what we call a critical illness plan. Um, sometimes medical plans come up short, um, especially again, most of us go to an insurance company when we're already in trouble and therefore the insurer has to limit the amount that they, you know, give us as coverage. If you buy a 10 million shilling plan, you get only about 10% is what will cover chronic illnesses that you already had, diabetes, um, heart disease, and so forth. And so what a critical illness plan does is to pay you a cash amount um, that helps you adapt to lifestyle changes, adapt to um, where treatment is best sought. Not everything else, not everything can be treated in the country, and therefore, um, you, if you get a cash payout, then you can seek treatment, whatever, adapt to whatever lifestyle changes come, you know, with an illness. What I'm pointing here is that there are forms of insurance that we're not aware of that are extremely critical, that are very pervasive in the Western society, that need desperately to be as pervasive in our African society. And then over and above that, um, you want to steer your family into investments that generate cash flow and in a sensible way. I think um, we are all quite obsessed about land, about building rentals, and we all know the nature of that. You, you know, you consume all your family cash and you could have a block of apartments, you could have a, you know, many acres of land, but when that emergency comes and there's a three million shilling bill, then you, you know, you don't have that money as a family unit. You have to borrow, go into debt, um, or have to foresell that investment, you know, at a, at a lower price than you would have. And that leads to destruction of wealth. 
And therefore, you know, you want to seek investment advice when your parent, for example, your siblings are, are transitioning, for example, your parent into retirement. Some may retire with a lump sum almost and almost always that lump sum is wasted. Um, and so you want to always be in your parents' face with regards to your finances. Their default mode is not to share information with you. You're the child, they're the parent. But it's time as a generation we try to break that as much as we can. Sit your parent down and tell them, look, we need to discuss what you're going to do with the little that you have, all right? So that you help them. They're from a different generation. They don't know as much as you do. And therefore, and also you have access to your investment advice and, and such, and you're able to contribute a lot more to what they will do with their money, all right? So you want to shape your investment strategy in not everything that consumes cash, such that the family unit has not much. Then you need to stagger your assistance to your parent. Um, one of the main traps that we fall into is to think that you know once a parent starts become, becoming dependent on you, it will stop or it will lessen. It never does. Um, you can imagine with old age, things always get worse. And so you want to limit your help when your parents are walking around. There will come a day when they will not be able to do that. And for their own good, you want to be able to be the parent in this case. Um, we, we know dynamics change. And by the time your parent is 70, 80, you're the parent, they're the child. Um, and, and, and without the discipline that they required of you as a child. Um, you know, so parents are able to, to do a lot in secret. They're able to not consult you and only come to you when there is financial disaster. You want to arrest that way before that happens. And that comes by always having honest conversations with parents as hard as they are. Driving that, um, bearing the pain that comes with, you know, the, the, the upsetting of balance of power. Um, having, forcing your father to have a conversation with you is not easy at all. Um, and, 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 and it's not something that, it's something you give up very fast. But what I do myself um, is to always try and talk about nothing else until they become tired and you wear them down and they finally hear what you're saying. That, that is a conversation that always must be had. So if your parent is retiring, always try and look for, for more retirement income solutions for them. Um, it's not always about building um, those blocks for rental income, a lot goes wrong with that. Um, or starting a, a business, your parent um, you know, retired from civil service and suddenly they have become um, experts in poultry farming and, 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 and planting maize. We all know how that goes mostly. So you want to get involved in your parents' financials, uh, financial matters, formalize them, look for solutions in the investment world that really we really have missed out on as an African society and as a Kenyan society, I can say. I think bottom line um, is really draw a hard stop, like Anthony said, um, you know, set a hard stop and say, look, maybe I can afford this. Um, I will help and, uh, up, till, up until this point, set a deadline and say for the sibling, I will help this point and no more. But worry about yourself because um, like I say, two broke people don't help each other. You have to set aside something for yourself, not something, a lot for yourself, because they will always get into trouble and you'll always be there to help them out. But try and stagger that before you run out of wind and then really you can't help anyone else. Um, I think that's mostly it. Um, there's a lot that can be said about investment um, and insurance plans. I'm always happy to share more information, but, but I think I've said um, quite a bit, thanks. My God, Stuart, um, that's as in people, we never have this conversation and, and the, our obsession with Kamwonda and Kaploti has made uh, very many parents have tied their cash, even we in the diaspora have tied our cash in, um, in structures such that we end up selling all these structures when something befalls on us. I, um, Stone and Tony, are you the 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 Tengis people, the ones who who are living in Kuruka, uh, Kayaba and Katwekera village 
and also um, the people living in my 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 village in Evoko. How are, are you? Are you? How are you targeting them? Are you reaching out to them because they are they, they don't have Zoom. They don't have bundles for one and a half hours. How are we helping them so that um, people don't take advantage of them and we bulletproof them in the in the in the in the future? Do they have? Do we have products for them? Are we talking to them? What are we doing for them? Let me take it first and then Stone will go. Uh, yeah. There are products for these people. I know I have worked with Zamara here in Kenya, and I know that they are, they are creating savings products for people in the Juakali sector. So these are people in the bottom of the pyramid. So they are creating products that are that people from on the from the bottom end of the pyramid can be able to take up and uh, start a savings culture. I am not in insurance. I'm a I'm a transitions coach, but in my work, I get to mingle with these people and have sat with uh, the managers of Zamara. And one of the things they're trying to do is to help Africa, in particular, embrace a culture of savings and. Uh, so they have products for the top of a pyramid that they have been selling and the middle class, and now they, have, they are serving the underserved. So yes, there are things that are being done for those people. And I'm sure Stone might even know more than I do. On, uh, in, in terms of uh, disseminating this information, yes, we do have, I think we can do better. We have organized groups. So it is always better to work with organized groups. I will choose as a Christian, me, I'll talk about the church. The church, is a, an organization that is able to reach the members of uh, a certain geographical area. So your local church is able to reach members of your geography, wherever it is situated and whoever comes there is welcome. So churches are also doing their bit in discussing uh, tax matters, in discussing issues to do with uh, saving and insurance, which I think is very, very helpful because for some of the people in the bottom of the pyramid who have to deal with black tax, they are business people. And a component of their work that requires them to be aware about is something like tax, the tax that they have to pay to government because once they are flagged as not paying tax, they could lose their business and lose their ability to earn money and lose their ability to contribute to BT where they are actually possibly being of help to their families. So yes, these formal groupings, if there are people here who don't go to church, perhaps who go to a mosque or, or, or an, organization, an organization like that, for instance, I, I am almost certain that they are doing their bit, especially in reaching this informal, the informal uh, sectors to, who cannot come to Zoom to teach them about some of these things. If we are not doing that, we should be having those conversations with people who have the power to gather a group because one-on-one uh, -on -one takes quite a bit to get the message out. But when we have organized groups, it is easier to get this uh, message reaching the right ears. And as I've, I've, I've said before, if you have the means and if you could sponsor your mother's home village um, group just for Tony and, and Stone to go there, they can sleep in your old bedroom, you don't care. But just sponsor them, pay them. Let, let, let's spread this information. We don't have to concentrate it in urban areas and people with English of the nose. Um, Stone, <laughs> Stone, could you comment on, on the same issue? And I think um, Deborah wants to know about what other investments you, you would recommend. And the NHIF, right. yes. And, and a touch on the NHIF beat, uh, Wairima has uh, commented, yes. Okay. Yeah, so your primary question was, um, do, are there solutions that trickle down to the most basic level? And the answer, like Anthony said, yes. Um, for example, um, at all Mucho, we, we have tried for a long time to what they call democratize investment. Um, so if you're talking about, for example, that house help example, or even that sibling or siblings that you've educated and they're on their own two feet, even if not earning much, even your own parents, um, primarily you must try and get them into a formal savings scheme 
um, and then try and shift responsibility to them. Uh, you're not responsible for anybody's happiness and you have to make them take the baby steps to do that. And for example, for savings, you know, we, we have a mobile um, savings plan that you invest as low as 10 shillings, literally. So any house help or anybody earning anything above 10 shillings um, has no excuse to say, you know, I, have, I really don't know how to save. And so, um, you know, just by saving anything from 10 shillings, 100 at whatever um, day of a month, then what you have started is a seed. Um, you've started a culture of saving, a culture of putting away, not consuming everything. Um, so those products are there and easy to, 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 to start on. Uh, for example, if, you, if you're in Kenya and you're from this session, you could dial stuff or ET hash. Um, and that's our plan that you could talk to your friends about your, your siblings, your relatives, and, and the example, for example, for the house app that was given here. So, and then when you um, scale it up to, for example, um, life insurance plans or funeral insurance plans, one of the things that I always um, tell people, whether it's my relatives or in those gatherings, and I tell them, look, if, if, if I talk to you about funeral insurance and you don't buy it because there's a plan for everyone. Um, for example, we sell um, a 50,000 shilling plan at 50 bob a month. Um, and that's something that most people will be able to do. If I come, if you if you call for a for a contribution, um, you know, what do you call this? A fund a fundraising, right? For 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 funeral, and I give you, you know, a hundred bob, but don't look at me badly because I give you ex I give you good advice. I shifted, you know, knowledge to your end, and you did nothing about it. So you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in a group or you're alone, there are investments and there are insurance plans for everyone. So, especially with the next generation, it's, it's very hard to imagine that, the, you know, the children we have are likely to continue with black tax and being very in touch with their relatives and so forth. Um, that's unlikely to happen. And so, I would say if we continue in the same trajectory of just, you know, let's get as many kids as we want, um, society will take care of them. There's a lot more misery that would that is coming if we, if we continue in that way. And therefore, you know, if, if, if someone is able to, if we're able to disseminate this information and everybody is able to know, look, it, it, does, it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to get insured. Um, and ultimately I will pay a lot less than you know, all the, all the costs that are associated with event A, event B. So yeah, I can confirm that, um, you know, those, those products are, are there and I'm, uh, I'm available to talk to anyone about them. With regards to um, formal investments, um, is this quite a long talk about it, but to touch on it, um, you know, when you want to diversify away from acres of land and, building Babati houses or whatever it is to house people. Um, there are, you know, um, you could use that money you have to lend to people who formally, who um, will take that money and give you interest. For example, the government does that, that, does that at a very large scale. You've heard of government bonds, government bills, um, for example, if you have a uh, hundred thousand shillings, you don't need to try and stretch that to build rental houses. If you invested with um, the government, um, then if the government promises you, for example, ten percent per annum, then that's income. For example, your parent could be earning in their retirement, and they don't need to run after tenants or complain to you. You know, you know, I need to renovate the house or things are going wrong with, you understand where I'm, where I'm going. So um, that's the one part where, you know, you invest with, um, you know, with a government security called a bond. Um, then all the way to, if you don't have 100,000 shillings, for example, and you have 5,000 shillings to start with, and you can top that up with 1,000 shillings a month, at least, then there are things called unit trusts where we as asset, as asset managers take that small amount of money 
uh, from a thousand of you or a million of you. Um, and then we bunch that up and then we go shopping for the best rates to the government, um, to the banks, you've heard of fixed deposits. And the point here is that the advantage is you're able to get that income that you want at the same rate as all these lucrative investments that you can think about. You'd be surprised how most investments just end up giving you really um, no more return in the region of 10, 12%. And when you get that income, your capital is more or less safe. Um, there are ways to look out for the fact that your investment is safe. I give talks on that. But my point is, when you're in an emergency, if there's a hospital bill and there's no insurance you've set up yet, then you don't need to borrow or, or do drastic things. Then you liquidate part of that investment and you're able to meet that need. So, um, and then you, you could scale that up to all kinds of investments um, that take you know, a different form where it's not your capital that is promised to you. It is you're investing as a shareholder in a certain kind of investment. Um, for example, buying shares on the stock market. Um, I think we are all aware of the, the blood pressure that will give you. Um, but you know, there, are, there are good ways to, to do that. There are good companies to invest in um, that have done well and uh, will continue to do well. And the point here is you're able to sell these things in an emergency. A unit trust, you're able to liquidate that in two days. Um, a government bond, um, you know, may not be very tradable, but, you know, again, there are ways that you could buy instruments that um, sort of um, leverage on the government bond uh, structure. So um, bottom line is there are a lot of investments we should be able to recommend to um, our parents and that I think, you know, not I think that I know lessens a lot uh, of, of, of the black tax effects on us. Um, you may have a parent who has a piece of land, but it's not sellable or they really don't want to get a bad price for it. And you can, you know, spare yourself a lot of pain while you to have started on alternative forms of investment uh, a lot, a lot earlier. Um, yeah. Um, NHF for parents, definitely, you, you should not be caught without paying an HRF. Um, and really not really for your parent, they, they should be able to pay that at least. Um, like we're saying here, personal agency, tell them, look, we will talk about even contributing to a medical insurance plan if at least you can show us that you've kept up that 500 bob for an HIF. You're trying to nudge behavior to, you know, to, 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 to the correct you know, way of living. Um, yeah, I think I've said a lot. Yeah, so products are there, investments are there, insurance is there. Talk to anybody, talk talk to myself. And um, it's an important conversation to have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, thank can you. Can I That's piggyback good. on Johnston a bit? Yes, and, and for uh, Johnston, you can share your contact. Mumulipe, our pair advice. We don't need to be taxing over here. Oh, and Tony to share your contacts <laughs> from Lipe Pia. Okay, okay, piggyback. And then- um, Fantastic. Uh -huh. and then? We've almost done two hours. So if okay. you can just do the, anything I left out and wind mm. us up. Yeah, or your last comments and just anything I, I should have discussed and didn't. Okay. <laughs> thank you again, Posa. Johnstone, thank you so very much. I didn't even know that Johnstone works uh, in the insurance industry. So it's it's very helpful to have a person like that in a conversation like this. Because one of the things that I had written down that I was going to say is that uh, all of us here need financial literacy. And uh, what Johnston has told us, he just glossed over it. So we, we actually need to sit down because of the grave importance of this matter, first and foremost, because it affects all of us in one way or another. Secondly, because we are trying to break the cycle. And I like that Johnson also said that. That's something else I had also wanted to say. If we do not uh, check ourselves, we will be setting our children up for the same problems of BT. And we need to break this cycle. So one of the things that I cannot insist enough is that we need to get fi ourselves financially literate so that we have budget, so that if we have to give, we are giving with a developmental angle.
to stop at some point so that they are able to take up these responsibilities. And I like what Johnson has just told us, our parents, even if they are so needy, at the very least, they should be able to pay NHIF. It's 500 bob per month. They should be able to do something like that to show some commitment so that they are not uh, just leeching on us, so to speak. So, Fosa, my comments to end this is that uh, I am so glad that we're having this difficult conversation. I think one of uh, the things that we should take away is that we should be more open with uh, money matters. In fact, I remember a someone once that I listened to and the first question that the preacher asked was, who knows, who outside of you are the person who pays you knows how much you make? Who are you accountable to enough to share with how much you make? And uh, the, the, the church was in silence. Not many people are bold enough to discuss their paycheck with anyone. And so we need to demystify that story if we are going to break this story, this whole cycle of BT, because money should not be a taboo subject. And now when we start discussing it, uh, we will be able to take it even to the places like our parents, like our siblings, so that we can have these honest discussions and uh, not shroud this story with a lot of mystery because it is this important. I think I'll stop there because I've talked about uh, the financial literacy part, which was going to be my uh, ending power. But I want to go back to that quote that I had somewhere about fishing. Uh, we need to stop giving fish. We need to teach people how to fish or better yet, buy them the lake so that they can, we can feed the generation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and or you can come to Minnesota, we have all the lakes. Uh, Stone, go ahead. Tufungie uh, Mkutano and your last takes, your take home message, and anything I left out. All right. So I think what one can say is that um, our extended family is mostly well meaning. Our parents are well meaning. We know that uh, they, they brought us up um, in incredibly difficult times. It's very hard to not reach into your pocket every time they they even bring something at you. Uh, so people are well-meaning, um, but the problem with um, humans is that we have creatures of habit. Uh, the moment, like we said, you know, there's a source of something else, um, then we gravitate towards that. If anything means less effort, as a human, you'll always gravitate towards that. A river always chooses the path of least resistance. So it, this is difficult to deal with. From a personal experience, I give up every week. Um, I go well-meaning to talk to you know, my parent and tell them, no, you, you, you need to style up. You, you, you're doing this, this the wrong way. Um, you have plenty of examples about of how they've really not thought through about something, um, and that, and and then you have to bear the cost of of, of them not doing that. Um, but it's a fight you must never give up. The dynamics of modern life are extremely complicated. Um, economics has become really something else. This is not the '90s anymore. Um, no one is looking out for you. Um, we've become a lot more individualistic, even with black tax. It does seem that this is the final generation to maybe deal with that. But the, 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 the whole point here is that whereas you know, these this, this family dynamics have changed, um, we must have the skills necessary to deal with that. Let's try and talk to our parents more. Um, it's easier maybe to talk to siblings and make noise at your sibling. It's a lot difficult to you know make noise at your parent it's it's not african you you really can't do that but it's to try and find ways in you know around you the personality of your parent to get them where you know you can um talk to them tell them look i have a family to feed i may may come a time i will not have anything the parent will respond with, you know, I brought you through thick and thin and, you know, I brought you up with nothing. I, I hear that a lot. Um, but, you, you know, the, the thing that I talked about, the trap of this um, cost, 
lessening, it doesn't, it gets worse. So you want to manage it when it's still a baby. You want to make sure your siblings do not contribute equally, for example, to the family burden. Uh, many cases I know where one sibling almost bears entirely the, the, the brunt. Um, and then before they know it, they're the ones who are you know, doing things, a lot of resentment builds from that. A lot of that contributes to broken marriages. You want to deal with, with such decisively. Um, this is a family thing. Everybody bears the burden equally. It doesn't matter the economic status or even if someone is economically badly off, they must contribute something. What you're doing is that you're building behavior that eventually over time will lessen the burden of BT. People behave better. Um, decisions are made better. Um, where Western societies are, that's where we want to be. We want um, you know, to, to be able to get the fruits of our labor as hard as we work. We want that to be commensurate and not spread too thin. Yeah, I think um, that's mostly it. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for the invitation. Hope to participate a lot more in future. Thanks, Poza. Thanks, um, Saya. Thanks, everyone. Have a good okay. evening, morning, whatever you want. Um, have, before I, I lock out any question, Kuna Maswali Kwa Wananchi, sir, I see your back. You can give the final vote of thanks. Is there anyone with a burning question um, or any topic you want us to discuss in the future? You can let us know. Sir, do you want to give a vote of thanks? Yeah, no, thanks, um, Mr. Wajohi, oh, that's Stone his name. And thank you, Mr. Kenyajui uh, um, Stone for, for the insights. And thank you for every person who's been able to contribute. Um, I would only like to encourage us to now move just from theory to action. And uh, we may not be able to, you know, implement a government policy that will change this, but I believe we can begin brightening our corner and as neighbors or friends begin seeing something changing within our immediate surrounding, they can copy that and the ripple effect can be able to do better. So um, I think, um, thanks for every person who's been able to ask or answer a question. Thank you for all signing up and thank you all, always for sharing this info. We count on your feedback. And we also count on your support to keep sharing what then keep letting us know what else we can do to serve you better, which are the authentic conversations we need. Um, we recently are now have added a YouTube channel. Um, Posa will put the link um, over here. Uh, we just look for authentic dialogues. Um, you can be able to catch up on this and um, some of the past dialogues on the YouTube channel. And of course, while you're there, please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we are putting together a plan to put more content there. So please feel free to keep visiting it. And um, yeah, subscribe so that when uh, we put more content, you can be able to be made aware. Um, outside of that, thank you, everyone. Once again, Barry Kue had. Let's make, um, let's make our generosity work for us so that it does not become a burden but it becomes a source of a blessing. Um, it doesn't become a state to make us um, create dependencies, but it becomes the tools to enable emancipation. I believe it is possible. Back to it, studio. Um, oh, thank and, you. Um, our, our next session, our next session has just been advertised. It is going to be on um, a, a very good segue for this particular session. We're going to be having a session on land helplessness in various domains of life, um, how we may be enabling it or facilitating it, and what can we be able to do to overcome um, land helplessness. So save the dates. Um, also, I believe it's next Sunday. Um, you'll be able to also get the poster and the information through the various channels you've been doing. So um, yeah, so back to you for. Asanteni Sana, and um, thank you very much. We don't take it for granted, thank you. And thank you for the impromptu guests, uh, Deborah and um, Joanne who stepped out. Thank you very much. If you can like, share, subscribe, 
um, our YouTube channel and uh, and and the, and this the Facebook um, link so that we can spread this conversation. Our work, we we have a calling, sir and I, to heal the world, and we are trying one person at a time. Tony Naston Asante Nisana. Um, you can leave at your own pleasure. I will stop the. I will stop the the the. I'll, I'll stop the 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 live.